Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Govin. I'm the Recreational Fisheries Program Manager for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, we wanted to bring to the public uh, a bunch of information about the 2023-2024 uh, summer steelhead uh, in the Columbia River and its tributaries. Uh, if you were with us last year, we did a very similar a webinar uh, where we wanted to make sure that you know we can get the information out to people on what's what to kind of be expected and the planning that's going in for the upcoming seasons. Um, we're going to hear tonight from uh, Columbia River Fisheries Managers uh, and the district biologists that manage each of the tributaries of the Columbia River uh, to give specific uh, presentations on each of the tributaries. So a lot of good information. Um, after uh, the webinar is over, it, it will be saved to YouTube and then posted to our Steelhead website on our webpage. Um, so, you know, if you missed it tonight or friends missed it tonight, there'll be an opportunity to to view it uh, in, in the future. Uh, one of the things that we want to make sure folks knew about, if you didn't know already, is that we're, we're really interested in hearing some specific questions on these topics that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, so there's a couple of different opportunities uh, for the public to submit questions to us. Uh, there's two ways. Uh, one is in the information is right here on the screen, but uh, go to www.myodfnw.com. And when you get to our website, you can search for steelhead management, and that'll take you to our steelhead management page. On that page, you, you'll click the title for, Sam, for steelhead management in the Columbian Snake Basins. Uh, and that'll take you to the information for this evening. And then on that page that you can click the link for the form and that's the question form. And then that'll pull up the questionnaire that you can ask a specific question. Uh, Michelle Dennehy from our information education program is in the room with me tonight. Uh, she'll be uh, receiving any questions that come in. Uh, then we'll be looking to answer those uh, with our biologist as time allows. Uh, the easier way uh, possibly is if you have a smartphone or a tablet or a way to scan a QR code as we created a QR code as you can see here right in the middle of the screen and if you scan that with your phone that'll bring you directly to that to that form so you can answer your question right there. Um, we want to make sure that you don't see this just once so throughout the entire presentation tonight you'll see this QR code uh, in the bottom right hand corner of the majority of the slides um, so that you can scan at any time and answer questions anytime as we go uh, as we go through this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to kick it over to start uh, to Dr. Sean Clemens, um, who is the administrator uh, uh, in, fish, in the fish division, and Sean will start um, start the presentation, then we'll move on from there. Go ahead, Sean. Thanks, Mike, and appreciate everyone being here. It's been a year since we were here and a lot's happened. Um, I know you all want to get on to hearing about what's going to happen in the, each of the trips this year in the main stem, but just a little bit of context before we get there. So the foundation for our steelhead management is really grounded in ODFW's mission, which is protecting and enhancing fish in their habitats for use and enjoyment by present and future generations. What we're really trying to achieve here is ensure that there's a um, solid foundation of conservation um, whilst maintaining that connection to the resource through angling. And there's a number of documents, policies, plans that guide our activities in this um, kind of area, including the ESA Endangered Species Act, multiple recovery plans, um, agency policies like the Native Fish Conservation Policy, uh, and then these fishery management evaluation plans. Next. And Sorry, Mike, can you go to the next one? And what you're going to see here in the um, in the following kind of presentations of each tributary and the main stem is some differences in the way we're managing across this um, geography. And a lot of that's tied up to the different characteristics that you see in, say, the main stem, which is a mixed stock fishery versus the tributaries, which are um, stock specific. Um, we have different strengths of the runs in these different tributaries. For example, the Walla Walla versus the, uh, um, the Umatilla, which you're going to hear about later. Um, some of these tributaries have hatchery steel here, which again changes our management. Um, some of these tributaries have a lot more effort on them, like the Deschutes versus the uh, Grand Ronde, for example, and so we can approach those differently. And then, then we also have different quality and availability of data. So again, thinking like the Grand Ronde, where we have multiple dams where fish can go through and we can get data from, and we have um, 
pretty good quality of spawning ground surveys. This is the John Day where we have less information at dams and less information on the spawning population. So all this together is why you see some differences in the way we manage across the landscape. Next, Mike. A couple of terms which if you tuned in last year you might be familiar with, but if not, um, it's the minimum abundance threshold and the critical abundance threshold. These were um, thresholds that were set in the early 2000s by independent sci science panels as part of the recovery process. And they're kind of benchmarks, but if you basically think of them as the minimum abundance threshold being um, a level at which population is viable and we really have no concerns. And then the critical abundance threshold is a, a lower level, at which, which is the higher risk of extinction. And we do have um, concerns at that point. And so we're really looking to limit um, impacts um, at or below the cat and then scaling impacts up as you get towards the, the map. So you'll see that in some of these presentations too. And then next. And then just some context for where we're at overall. Um, the reason we've been having these webinars these last two years is really this um, trajectory we've been on since about 2016, where you've seen these continued poor runs, um, and we're predicting another poor run this year. Uh, next. Actually, sorry, we'll stay on this one. And the reasoning for this is for a long time now, the hydro system's been having some significant impacts, particularly in the upper basin. Um, but then layered on top of that, we've got uh, impacts in the ocean, which are becoming increasingly important in the life history of steelhead in particular. We've seen some really poor um, years in the ocean, particularly 2021, um, when the North Pacific Gyre Index was really low, um, record low, and that resulted in, um, well, that kind of was attributed to the um, kind of post-wide collapse we saw in summer steelhead a couple of years ago. We have seen ocean conditions improve recently, um, but it seems like it might be temporary and we're going into another El Nino um, coming up this, this winter and so likely the conditions are going to get worse again. So we're in this protracted long phase of low returns and so we need to be managing cautiously and that's kind of what you're going to see reflected in some of these management strategies that you see here, which are really a continuation of some that you've seen for the past few years. So I think now we're going to start with a um, dive into the main stem Columbia and Tucker. Are you taking that one? Yes, I am. Sorry. Just took me a minute to uh, to scroll the mouse over to the mute button. So thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, main stem Columbia River fisheries. I guess to start, you know, main stem fisheries for Oregon really occur in jointly managed waters from the mouth all the way down to Bowie 10, uh, upstream to the Oregon-Washington uh, state line, uh, though the impacts continue up a little bit further. Um, you know, as Sean said, these are uh, mixed stocked fisheries uh, and they're jointly managed by Oregon-Washington. Uh, and so we have to have concurrent regulations uh, in order to have orderly fisheries. Within these fisheries, there are multiple uh, summer steelhead stocks um, that are used in main stem Columbia River fisheries management. Uh, these stocks are or groupings are defined by you know, the run timing um, or fish size and are used really for fishery management purposes, and they do not necessarily equate uh, to population stocks as defined under the ESA. Uh, so what are the, the different stocks that we're uh, intercepting in main stem fisheries? Well, generally we have uh, the Scamania stock, uh, and these are fish that are passing Bonneville uh, between April 1 and June 30, um, destined you know, really for, for sort of lower tributaries within Bonneville pool um, and have their own separate rates. And then we have, uh, Interior, whoa, sorry, a little bit of um, whiplash there. Uh, and then we have some interior basin uh, summer steelhead that are are destined for those more interior basin streams. And, and we divide those into A index uh, and B index steelhead. A index, uh, both of them are passing Bonneville uh, between July and October. And really, for management purposes, we use a length. Um, 
to you know define the difference between the two. So anything less than about 31 inches, uh, we determine to be or we define as an A index. Uh, and anything that is greater than or equal to 31 inches uh, is a B index. Now those B index fish, a true B index is is you know, primarily from the Snake River Basin, uh, but for management purposes, any uh, steelhead over 31 inches is counted as a B index. Next slide, please. So this is uh, similar to what um, we saw a little bit earlier, only just uh, confined to those A and B index wild summer steelhead returns between 1997 and 2002. And you can see these sort of fluctuated through time, but since about 2016 is, have been in a, a more prolonged uh, downturn period. Um, you know, these are combined, but just so folks know, typically A index steelhead are, are more abundant in the system than B index. Uh, they usually make up to 85 to 95% of the run, uh, though they can range down as low um, as 60 and 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 a little bit more than 95, depending on a given year. Next slide. So the next series of slides are, uh, you know, really looking at uh, sort of the return of a given stock uh, versus the harvest in um, in our non-treaty fisheries. So, uh, so I'm just going to spend a quick moment to orient you. On the left axis is the harvest. Um, and on the right axis or the secondary y-axis is the return numbers. Uh, and these are scaled uh, together so that folks can get a sense of, um, you know, the, the fisheries in relation to the returns. Uh, these are actually divided. It's pretty hard to tell, though, um, between upriver fisheries and downriver fisheries, so above, below Bonneville. And, and what you really can see is, the fisheries do go up and down based on returns, but are, are pretty low, and almost all of um, the Skamania stock fisheries are, are harvested downstream of um, Bonneville Dam. Uh, and I would say that, you know, since about 2000, uh, we've never used more than about uh, a quarter of our allowable um, Skamania ESA impacts. Next slide. So again, now looking at A index, uh, harvest on the right, sorry, on the left, returns on the right, uh, scaled the same for sort of relative impacts. Uh, again, you can see that uh, fisheries sort of fluctuate up and down as, um, as returns do. Uh, and that for A index, you know, you, you really see sort of a mix uh, of where these fish are harvested, uh, though there is, generally speaking, a trend where when we're having retention fisheries, uh, there are more either, you know, harvested in the main stem above Bonneville or also in some of those tributaries that uh, that are upstream of Bonneville Dam as they dip in. Uh, again, since 2000, in our combined non-treaty fisheries, uh, we've only used, on average, about 41% uh, of our allowable A index. And, and over the last five years, that's only been about 30%, so less than a third of the allowed uh, A index uh, impacts have been used by our main stem fisheries. Next. Sorry, and then finally, uh, again, similar, the B index, uh, summer steel returns, um, again, fluctuate over time. And, and then here, really more disproportionately, um, when we have retention fisheries, Generally speaking, um, the impacts, whichever we do accrue, typically accrue upstream of Bonneville Dam, you know, or in those tributary dip-ins. Um, and again, really use a low proportion, again, since 2000, only about 45%, and really only about a quarter of the allowable impacts over the last five years uh, for B-index. Next. So, you know, Fisheries fluctuate up and down through time. We've been in a fairly prolonged downturn for um, interior basin steelhead at, at this point in time. Uh, and we kind of um, you know, hit this you know, management 
structure that that really allows us to target other more abundant stocks during these times uh, and still allow main stem fisheries to occur. So these are going to look pretty similar to the previous years. Um, remember, of course, that in commercial fisheries, non-treaty commercial fisheries, steelhead retention has been um, prohibited since 1975. Uh, in recreational fisheries, um, barbless hooks and hatchery steelhead only when they're open for retention. Uh, you know, from buoy 10 to the to the tongue point line, it, it's uh, really closed now through October. Um, and then from Tongue Point to the Dallas Dam, uh, the daily limit will be one through um, through July 31, and then close to retention until uh, November 1st. Uh, and then from the Dallas Dam up to the Highway 395, so for Oregon anglers, you know the Oregon Washington State line, unless they possess a Washington non-resident license, um, open with a daily limit of one. Uh, through August 31, and then closed to retention after that. Next. <clears throat> so uh, just re really wrapping up here, uh, main stem Columbia River fisheries, uh, along with all of our um, you know, steelhead or Chinook or coho are all actively managed in season through the, the compact and joint state hearing process. Um, as updated run sizes become available, um, we scale fisheries up or we scale fisheries down as appropriate uh, so that we are making sure that we um, you know, really stay within our conservation constraints. It, you know, fisheries, I think, are an important part of the conservation picture, both recreational and, and commercial fisheries. Uh, providing access and a connection to the resource that aren't there. And, and I don't know for folks who who haven't seen it, NOAA uh, released a report last year, uh, last September, uh, called Rebuilding the Interior Columbia Basin uh, Salmon and Steelhead uh, Report. And, and in that report, you know, fisheries did not rank as a significant limiting factor. Really, that identified, you know, depending on, on what sort of population sections you were looking at within the the basin, the hydro system, uh, habitat and predation impacts, as well as blocked access to historic habitats, uh, which were consistently the highest ranked threats. So that's, um, you know, and, and so fisheries can be an important way to keep people tied to the resource. And that's, I think, um, a really beneficial place for us to be. With that, I'm going to wrap it up and hand it to uh, Jason Seals who is the district biologist for the Deschutes River, and who you probably all want to see tonight anyways. Uh, thanks, Tucker. You didn't introduce yourself, but thanks for introducing me. Uh, Jason Seals, district fish biologist uh, in the Mid-Columbia District. Uh, our district is all of the lower 100 miles of the Deschutes, uh, west to the crest of the Cascades and everything in between. Um, but tonight I'm just talking about the Deschutes um, so I'm gonna, I don't have a lot of slides. I only have a handful of slides. I'm gonna review um, the Deschutes Fishery Framework, which we developed last year and presented last year. And we, we, we followed the framework last year. I'm gonna talk about how the framework uh, was applied in 2022 and then what to expect in 2023. Next slide, please. So this is um, basically, this is uh, cliff notes of the framework. Um, there are a lot of details in the framework. Um, if you haven't taken a look at them, um, you know, I, I would recommend that you try to dive into the details, but um, it is a little bit hard to comprehend. So hopefully um, with these cliff notes, it'll help you understand. But um, so the initial parameter is that by May 1st of every year, we will estimate the previous run year. So um, say for this run year, which is 22-23, so the run year that people were fishing on last year is now finishing spawning, we will estimate the number of wild steelhead that are passing over Shears Falls. And if the, the number of uh, steelhead that we estimate passing over shears is greater than 625, the fishery will stay open. 
Um, if it is below 625, the fishery will start closed. Um, and starting on July 1st, um, we so from July 1 to July 31, um, we're, we will be monitoring the number of steelhead passing unmarked steelhead, so wild steelhead or unmarked steelhead passing during that time frame. And we're looking for a minimum of 9,900 wild steelhead passing over Bonneville to keep the fishery open. Um, if we're below 9,900, um, we know that we're going to be in conservation mode and that we're unlikely to meet the 625, which is what I mentioned, which Sean talked about earlier, which is our critical abundance threshold. Um, so uh, if we get above 9,900, um, we're confident that uh, we will be abun above that threshold. Um, we The second um, metric that we'll be looking at um, is July 1st to August 31st, and we're looking for a minimum of 21,000, or excuse me, 23,100 wild steelhead over Bonneville. And again, if we don't meet that metric, then we will close um, um, set, is September 15th. Um, and then the third metric that we're looking at is based on our the number of steelhead that we capture it at our shears trap on the Deschutes. So uh, if we capture over 60 wild steelhead shears trap, we'll stay open by October 31st. Um, if we're over 120 wild steelhead, uh, we will reopen if the fishery is closed. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just how the framework uh, worked in 2022. Um, I think as most people know, we did not meet the 625 threshold in our estimate by May 1st. And so we started the fishery closed. Um, so the, the actually the point estimate was 523 wilds above shears. Um, so uh, we started counting or monitoring passage over Bonneville starting on July 1. So between um, July 1 and July 31st, there were 15,545 unmarked steelhead that passed over Bonneville. So we were above the 9,900 um, threshold that I mentioned in the previous slide. And so we did open the fishery, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, and same with the, the second threshold, which is July 1 to August 31st. Uh, it was 26,210 unmarked steelhead, which was above the 23,100, which I mentioned also. Um, and then as far as our shears trap, uh, we did capture 141 unmarked steelhead. And so we were well above the, the minimum of 60 to keep the fishery open. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a review of the TAC forecast. Um, I know Tucker didn't really talk about it, but... Um, the boxes that are highlighted in red are the, the top box, uh, which is 17,300. That's the forecast for wild A index. And then the 1,300 um, in the lower red box is the forecast for wild B index. And so those two combined are is 18,600, which is well below uh, our threshold uh, from July 1st to August 31st of 23,100. So, um, you know, if this forecast is accurate, you know, we, we certainly could be looking at some restrictions. Next slide, please. So what to expect in 2023? Um, currently, all of our data has not come in, um, but it is, it's, it's looking good for uh, being well above our, our minimum threshold. Um, right now, it's looking like our estimate will be, to, be between 1,100 and 1,800 fish. So we will start the fish fishery open. Um, and then starting on July 1st, uh, we will start monitoring the fishery, as I mentioned in previous slides. So, um, but, you know, if the forecast is correct, you know, we certainly could be seeing closures August 15th or September 15th. Um, and then the final is just the, if the forecast is correct, you know, we're likely to see less than 120 fish at shears as well. So we would stay closed. Um, and I guess just finally, 
to wrap up um, before we go on to the John Day is, you know, I, I'm sure there's some questions out there as to what, you know, why if the forecast is so low, why aren't we preemptively closing, you know, the Deschutes and other tributaries as well. But, you know, the way our framework is designed is, you know, we do have a real advantage in that we can use Bonneville to monitor, you know, real time what, you know, how many fish are going over. And then because we know we have strong relationships between what we see at Bonneville and what we see um, in our escapement based on the Bonneville counts. So we have the luxury of closing, you know, fisheries if we have to. Um, and so I, I think that's the the real advantage of, you know, waiting until we actually see, you know, what is returning instead of preempting preemptively closing it based on the forecast, because a lot of times, um, I'm sure as most of you know, that these forecasts are not always accurate. So hopefully that will be the case this year. Um, and I guess, you know, the other thing to mention that is that, you know, while we're monitoring during the month of July, you know, if we, we are going to start with the fishery open, but, you know, then if we do decide to close, you know, we still, because of all the data that we have on Creel and the shoots, we know that, you know, greater than 75% of the fish that are captured are after August 15th. So if we close it by August 15th, we still have significant um, conservation savings um, in the fishery. So um, that's all I had, and I'll pass it on to Steph. Thanks, Jason. Uh, my name is Steph Shrett. I'm the district fish biologist for the John Day watershed. Uh, the, my district is essentially any drainage that flows into the John Day River system. Um, and my contact information is on the board. So feel free to call me or email me if you have any questions after the presentation. Uh, next. So the John Day is a unique fishery for the mid-sea. It is a completely wild fishery. The only hatchery fish in the system are strays, and that's predominantly from the Snake River Basin. One of the goals of the recreational fishery is to remove hatchery strays as we see them, and they're targeted in the recreational fishery. Um, one unique issue, Dr. Clements tied into a lot of issues that have um, impacted steelhead in our basin, but one of them that's kind of unique to the John Day is the overshoot. So we see a lot of adults overshooting the mouth of the John Day. And several of them, many of those 60%, upwards of 60% of our population of adults that return do overshoot and many of them do not come back. They spend a lot of time in the McNary pool and then they fall back to the John Day, but some of them don't make it. Um, and then a lot of other basins in the mid sea have some pretty um, awesome tools to estimate and count adults coming back to the system in the John Day. We're limited because of the fact that we have no dams and no weirs or no operations to accurately count adults coming back. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, we do have pretty good correlation though with our smolt abundance. We do a pretty, pretty good job uh, monitoring and counting uh, smolts leaving the system. So that helps out a lot. And we, and we correlate that to Bonneville dam counts as well as our estimate of adults escapement and uh, pit tag returns, as well as um, DHOS, which is uh, our proportion of hatchery fish. We are also have a decent handle on that, and we know that it's correlated to the proportion of barged fish in the Snake River. Uh, next, please. So the John Day is a, is a system that isn't officially having two se seasons, but I kind of like to frame it as uh, the September through December timeframe is predominantly in the lower system below Service Creek. A lot of fishing happening there below Spray um, all the way to McDonald Ferry. And then as we move into the February, March, April timeframe, um, fishermen, fisherwomen, everybody starts targeting uh, the upper system in the Monument North Fork area, as well as just below Kimberly between Kimberly and Spray. So um, they're we know from previous creel efforts that it's predominantly a fly fishing, um, mostly a fly fishing uh, river. There is some bait and there is uh, some 
hook, uh, jig, bobber and jig fishing, but we know that at least in the lower river from creel data that it is predominantly a fly fishing um, targeted sea, uh, fishery. Uh, next slide, please. And this is our framework uh, within our FMEP. And as you can see, we chose 20,000 as a, as a bottom level um, count of wild A's. And that usually has, at, at least in the last few years, has correlated to a just slightly below 2% SAR or smolt to adult ratio, um, return ratio. And so um, I feel pretty comfortable that that 20,000 mark is, is the bare minimum of what we need to see. Uh, and below that or around 20,000 is getting into uh, a concerning number for returns of adults in the John Day. Next, please. And this is our natural origin spawner abundance for or our estimates. Um, again, as I said, uh, it's not the most accurate way of counting fish in the John Day because we are limited to red counts through, through the spawning season, but we do try and estimate the numbers of adults returning. It's just a little bit more challenging to hang your hat on solely these numbers. Uh, we do have to look at correlation with juveniles as well as Bonneville dam counts to get a better handle on what's going on just simply because of the nature of the John Day River and the difficulties uh, counting adults when they come back to the system. Next, please. And this one is a new slide, and I wanted to present it to you because it's some interesting uh, developments that our fish research program has been working on. And um, we, since we do know a little bit about juveniles and a better handle on juveniles leaving the system, I'll explain this graph a little bit because it looks a little funky. But uh, the figure matches the abundance of juvenile steelhead leaving the South Fork on the vertical axis um, to the count of unmarked steelhead at Bonneville during the July, August timeframe. And we know that from pit tags and, and tracking devices that we've implanted in steelhead, that generally the July to August timeframe is when most of the uh, John Day River destined fish are coming through the Bonneville system. Uh, so that's kind of our critical period of counting adults over Bonneville is the July, August, because that's predominantly where our, our John Day fish are coming in. Uh, it's this is commonly referred to as a stock recruitment curve, and it can be used to identify stocking levels or uh, that can or maybe cannot support a recreational fishery impact. Um, in this case, we're looking at unmarked fish over Bonneville and the color coded lines is the average predicted number of juvenile steelhead migrating past the John Day Dam on their way to the ocean, so leaving the system on the way to the ocean, that will result in a level of unmarked adults coming back over Bonneville dams within that one to three year time frame. The color coding in red is that we have no ev evidence as of yet that there are enough parents to keep the progeny or juveniles in the range of normal variation observed in other years when we have a better count of adults. The red zone is our best quantitative description of where every adult counts because without those we're going to be even hurting even more if we even lose any of those adults um, when we're in this abundance range the data suggests that the population is going to is unlikely to rebound in a very quick one generation time frame so that's where our concern is really when we're in that red zone um, the yellow zone is the both parents abundance and freshwater conditions could be limiting juvenile production and there's more evidence that the adult abundance in this range, given good freshwater conditions, uh, the juveniles would be able to rebound and bounce the population back up within one generation. And then in the green zone, the parental abundance is at the desired goal and can be consistently achieved. Um, what we also see is, as uh, you know, those little black dots kind of flatten out. So even if we have very high numbers of adults returning, the numbers of juveniles coming out of the John Day detected at Bonneville Dam kind of flattens out, suggesting that there is some fresh water conditions going on, um, some uh, you know li ri limiting rearing habitat, as well as um, issues with these fish navigating through the Columbia River power system. Um, so the juvenile production appears to be exclusively driven by freshwater conditions in the green zone, but at the same time, we have the adults to make up for it. Um, where we have full or near full seeding of habitat that 
that we have available for juveniles. So they have to explore other areas and move around. And this is actually good, a uh, good favorable characteristic for the long-term adaptation of steelhead, um, given the changing freshwater conditions as well as the ocean conditions. Next, please. And then for the outlook of 2023, shouldn't be a big surprise since we kind of have 20,000 as the lower bottom level limit of what we need to see to even consider having a fishery. And, um, you know, in that previous slide, I showed you that red line kind of starts getting into the yellow around 25, 29,000 adults over Bonneville. So that is really, um, and I've said it before, but, you know, when we're in the 30,000 plus range of adults returning over Bonneville, we feel pretty strongly that the data indicates that we're in a good place and we're not impacting the fish, the fish so much with our recreational fishery. Now, when we're in that 25,000 and below, we're starting to see some impacts that could potentially have long-term effects on the return of population. So the current TAC forecast is 17,300 wild A's is well below our recreational fishery threshold. Um, we're gonna continue to evaluate the relationship of juvenile data and adults over Bonneville and try and really narrow down uh, what would be an acceptable curve for us to have a recreational fishery. Um, and we're also continually evaluating options for during those low, but not critically low abundance years on how to frame a recreational fisheries to minimize impacts. And with that, thank you very much. I will answer some questions at the end. And I think Taylor's up next. There he goes. Uh, thanks very much, Steph. Um, Taylor McCroskin, the district fish biologist for the Umatilla and Walla Walla rivers. My contact information is located on the slide. And uh, as Mike said, you can access that information after the presentation. Next slide. Uh, so this is a map of the Umatilla and Walla Walla drainages. The drainages are in blue. Uh, for the Umatilla, the fishery is located in yellow. So the mouth of the Umatilla is located near Umatilla, Oregon moves upstream through Hermiston into Pendleton. And after you get past Pendleton, that's the start of the Confederated uh, Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Um, almost all the primary spawning habitat is upstream of Pendleton. We do have one downstream location of spawning habitat below Pendleton, but majority of that is located upstream of Pendleton. Um, then you move into the Walla Walla Basin, which is that uh, stream here in red. Um, Mouth is located near the closest town, really, is Tushi, Washington, um, Lua Junction. Most of the Walla Walla River is located in uh, the Wash state of Washington, however, but majority of the spawning area is actually located in the state of Oregon. So that black line, uh, I don't have the cursor, but that black line on the second or the uppermost uh, blue line watershed is a state line between Washington and Oregon. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to highlight some significant differences between the Umatilla and Walla Walla rivers compared to the other mid sea tributaries. So on the Umatilla, we have the wonderful opportunity to have an adult fish trap as well as a video weir at Three Mile Falls Dam. This gives us an opportunity to count every single fish that passes that dam. So we know exactly what's in the system, how many fish, um, year after year. Uh, we also have a juvenile fish counting facility and pit tag arrays for juveniles in the downstream fish ladders. Um, so we also can count those juveniles as they're leaving. And we also have screw traps located in the upper basin to be able to pit tag those fish as well. So have a really great counting opportunity to know what's coming back as well as what's migrating out of the system. Again, in the Walla Walla uh, River, we do have a video weir at Nursery Bridge Dam, which is located in Oregon. Uh, and we also do have a floating pit tag array at the mouth. Um, again, as uh, and st same as in Steph's system, uh, the hatchery program in the Walla Walla River was discontinued by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife in 2018. So no longer are there any hatchery releases in the Walla Walla system. So I want to make sure to highlight that as we move forward. So. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, graph showing the returns on the Umatilla River. Um, so the green line represents our minimum abundance threshold, which is 1500. Our red line represents the critical abundance threshold. 
and the blue bars look at are the wild fish and the black bars are the hatchery fish. So as you can see here, um, we've been well above our critical abundance threshold and almost are reaching our minimum abundance threshold for the umatilla population. And they are doing quite well um, and are continuing to do so. Next slide, please. Walla Walla, on the other hand, is not, however, unfortunately. Um, again, the minimum abundance threshold is located the green uh, horizontal bar there. Critical abundance threshold is that red bar. The blue bars are the wild fish. Um, as you can see here, from 2017 to 2023, we have not been above our critical abundance threshold. So that population is very much struggling. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no longer releases of hatchery steelhead in the system uh, anymore. And so you can again see those declines in hatchery population. So um, we're not fishing on hatchery fish anymore. And most of those hatchery fish don't make it all the way up into the Oregon stretch since uh, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is releasing those hatchery fish in the Tushi River, which is a significantly downstream tributary of the Walla Walla. Um, so next slide, please. So for the proposed steelhead regulations for 2023-24, the Umatilla will be open um, unless that forecast significantly changes and the Walla Walla River will be closed. Um, there is a proposal to permanently close the Walla Walla River until pop wild populations improve. We feel like that's an imperative thing to do to work towards uh, improving that population and taking some of that pressure off that wild population just due to the fact that it's been below that critical abundance threshold for the past five years. So um, I'll, any questions, I'll be happy to answer after their presentations. I'm going to hand it over to the district fish biologist for the Grand Ron and the Naha River, Kyle Bratcher. Thank you. Hi folks, so I'm district fish biologist in uh, Enterprise, Oregon. Um, so I manage uh, the Snake River tributaries in Oregon. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So just to orient everybody, you can see here where our primary steelhead fisheries are that are highlighted in yellow. One is in the Imnaha River, uh, major population groups. These are two different uh, populations, and then one is in the Grand Ron. Um, the pink line is where steelhead fisheries are open. However, those areas receive um, very little effort, um, and, and we don't really focus on monitoring those. Um, so just want to point out how far upstream this is and note that these are over or past the four lower Snake River dams. And while those dams are fairly detrimental to our fish in the Snake River Basin, we they do give us the ability to count these fish as they as they come into the system. And um, there's a um, so if you go to the next slide, Gavin. Um, so that plays pretty heavily into our decision timeline on when we're going to decide what to do with these fisheries. So you can see we're on a fairly different timeline than the Deschutes and the John Day and the Walla Walla. We can sit and look at Ice Harbor Dam, which is the lowest dam on the Snake River, and watch these fish come in. So by uh, August 1st, we've only seen about 8% of the fish even make it in to the Snake River system. By September 5th, 1st, it's about 10%, so they're still trickling in into September. By, and then it really kicks up going into late September. So by late by September 26, we've seen about 50% of the fish pass Ice Harbor Dam. And so what that gives us the ability to do is wait. Um, our, while our steelhead fishery does open on September 1st, there's not a lot of effort and not a lot of not a lot of fish being caught until we get into um, into October. You can see we only see about 1% of our wild steelhead encounters by October 1st. So it gives us the ability to see what's coming at us before we um, get into the meat of our fishery and start seeing those impacts on fish. So what I'm looking at in our framework is to have about 3,000 fish over Ice Harbor Dam by September 26, and that'll give us enough fish to be over our critical abundance thresholds, and uh, we'll, we'll likely keep the fishery open. So I'll be monitoring that as the season goes on and keeping people updated on what we're seeing. Um, the good part is like, <laughs> it's difficult to use a hard number like that when the fish could be early or the fish could be late. So we can always uh, circle back and look at that passage at Bonneville and when those fish came over, because we were typically at over 90% of passage at Bonneville at that time. So we can even look back down river to help inform our decision. So maybe we're a little bit over 3000, but it looks like the fish were really early, um, which means we're not going to get as many as we thought. So we can, we have other places that we can look and, uh, 
and inform our decisions. Go ahead and go on to the next slide. So this is what abundance has looked like in these two populations over the last few years. Um, you can see that we're continually above uh, that critical abundance threshold. And even in some of these bad years, like um, two years ago, the Amnaha actually reached that uh, minimum abundance threshold. Uh, so I've got this, these population estimates are part of a multi-state, multi-government, including the tribes and the feds effort to um, reconstruct the run after it's over. So it includes a lot of things like uh, it takes into consideration um, overshoot and things like that. So we, um, it's the best population estimate we have. It's far better than uh, what Steph's getting from spawning surveys, as he mentioned, that's pretty tough. So we get we get really good numbers. We can build some really nice relationships and get an idea of what it's coming at us. So um, the 23-24 season on the very far right there is what I would project will make it back to these two populations if the TAC forecast is correct. So um, still above that, uh, minimum abundance threshold, or sorry, the critical abundance threshold um, at where we'd likely keep fisheries open. We have very low impacts on these fish in, our, in Oregon fisheries, less than 1% of the fish we figure are, impact, are, are killed in these fisheries. Um, we typically get more fish than the shoots and a lot less effort. So go on to the next slide. So what I'm proposing right now is if we're equal to or above the forecast, we'll be open. I've done a lot of work to um, looking to what back reduce reduced bag limits would do, um, and and they just aren't going to help us a whole lot. We've done some analysis on that, and it saves us in like the single digits of uh, natural origin um, mortality. So, uh, so in our as I said earlier, our efforts our our angler effort is pretty low in the area. So uh, we're just going to stick with open or closed right now. Um, until we see an increase in effort or some kind of change out there. Um, if we come in below a forecast, I'm going to have I'm going to be keeping a really close eye on this uh, to make sure we're going to achieve the numbers we need to have that open. Uh, we could be looking at a closure if we get down towards that critical abundance threshold um, that may be in one or both MPGs, depending on where we are. Um, and just want to point out, I have this QR code on here. I'll be sending out periodic email updates throughout the year on what things look like and you can scan that and sign into a form that'll uh, get you on that email list if you'd like but that's what i have for you uh thanks kyle and, and not to confuse folks with two qr codes but uh that other one he mentioned was his for, for kyle himself or his newsletter um again as we mentioned in the beginning um here's a qr code you can scan right now if you have any more questions to ask uh, we do have a fair amount of questions that we'd like to field and so we'll start going through those right now and i'll just read them off to the district biologist and then they'll they'll pop up on the screen and um and answer those so first one we're gonna i'm gonna try the best i can to organize these you know working from the columbia river upstream um but depending on how the questions come in we might jump around a little bit so the first question uh is for tucker jones from the columbia Tucker, we had a question here from Bob, um, and his question is, rather than having staggered seasons along the Columbia River that allows individuals the opportunity to fish continually by following the open areas upriver, why doesn't the Department of Fish and Wildlife allow the desired escapement to occur before having any season and then adjust season length bag limit accordingly to the strength of the annual run for steelhead? Thanks, uh, Mike. Um, well, you know, the answer is we try to do a little of that. Right? We try to overlap seasons that are close by as much as possible to, uh, you know, force people to choose where they want to go fishing. Um, it, you know, if you waited for, you know, the escapement to pass everybody, you know, if, if this is about waiting for tributary escapements, well, uh, you know, there wouldn't be any main stem opportunity by the time we knew what the tributary escapements were. Um, and then we would concentrate all the effort in those tributaries. Uh, similarly, you know, the, things can happen in the main stem that way. Um, but, you know, these are mixed stock fisheries also, um, right? And so some of them are stronger and some of them are weaker. And if you allow main stem fisheries to occur, 
you know, then you have the ability to spread that impact out also across the stocks instead of concentrating it on particular stocks. Um, so I guess, you know, the answer is it's difficult to find a spot when everybody uh, has a quality opportunity to fish at the same time. But we do do that to the extent we can uh, to try to, you know, reduce the amount of people who are, you know, basically following the fish upriver. Okay, th thanks, Tucker. Another question from Bob um, and for the Columbia. Does Oregon know if Washington plans to implement thermal angling sanctuaries? Uh, I do not believe Washington has decided that they are going to pursue that as a management strategy at this time. Uh, they do have some areas that, uh, you know, do provide the potential for uh, cold water refuge habitat. Uh, they've done some of their own analyses and decided that uh, it, it wouldn't really have a tremendous impact uh, for, you know, a tremendous beneficial fisheries impact for their stocks. Uh, you know, Oregon has really looked at this sort of longer term downturn uh, in interior basin summer steelhead populations and has really taken a more of a, a kitchen sink, I think, approach in terms of you know, doing what we can where we can, a, a real precautionary approach uh, in terms of trying to reduce our impacts. Thanks, Tucker. Uh, one more question here for you. I'm going to paraphrase because it's kind of a long one, a couple of parts to it. Um, question from Jacob. Uh, Tucker, uh, why limit uh, catch and release fishing for salmon and salmon or steelhead while still allowing for gill nets to operate in the Columbia River? All right. Well, uh, you know, fisheries impacts are uh, divided up, right? We divide them relatively equally between the treaty fisheries and the non-treaty fisheries. And then within the non-treaty fisheries, we also divide those up between uh, recreational fisheries and non-treaty commercial fisheries. Um, you know, we work really uh, closely with the commercial fishing industry uh, to really try to, to use time, area, and space, uh, as well as gear restrictions to minimize interceptions of non-target fish. And, and those are pretty successful fisheries. And those fisheries are, are really important, right? Not, a, you know, as I said, fisheries, I think, are incredibly important to uh, help connect people to the resource. But not every person or member of the public is an angler or not every person owns a boat or can afford to go fishing uh, or can go traveling. And some of them, you know, want that connection. And commercial fisheries, uh, you know, provide that opportunity for people to have a Columbia River fish, to have that connection to the resource. And those commercial fisheries are incredibly valuable to to local communities from an economic perspective. So, you know, we we uh, in fall seasons for uh, you know Chinook give about seventy percent of the limiting stock to the recreational fisheries, and about thirty percent to commercial fisheries. We use, like I said, time, area, and space. Main stem fisheries are confined to uh, areas upstream of Warrior Rock. Uh, at times when they're least likely to impact steelhead. And then we also have significant off-channel terminal fisheries to sort of maximize, um, you know, those connectivity and economic benefits per impact allowed. Thank you, Tucker. For the essence of time, I'm going to kind of move on. Uh, okay. We have a lot of questions that have come in, so we want to get to as many as we can before our time's up. Um, kind of moving up river to Jason. Jason, a couple of few questions for you, as you can imagine. Uh, first one, Jason, is from Kai. Um, the question is, if the Deschutes is closed for steelhead, what is the plan for the hatchery fish returns? Um, well, certainly, you know, when we, you know, close a fishery like we, you know, we did last year and the year before, you know, that's always one of the concerns is, you know, we want anglers out there, um, you know, and we want them harvesting hatchery fish. That's what they're there for. Um, so it is, you know, it's often a tough call to, you know, we want anglers out there, we want to encourage harvest. Um, but when we, you know, get into this, you know, critical conservation mode where, you know, we can't afford to, you know, 
have population impacts um, from our fisheries on wild fish, um, you know, we it is it is hard sometimes to remove hatchery fish. Um, in the Deschutes, we we have a couple places where hatchery fish are removed um, for the round for round butte stock, which is the Deschutes stock hatchery fish. Um, all fish that are not used for brood stock, which are collected at um, Pelton Dam, which is the lowest dam on the Deschutes. Um, at that trap, we capture every steelhead that goes in there, and it either goes to brood stock or it gets uh, donated, killed and donated. So um, also at Warm Springs National, they also remove any, they don't have a hatchery program there, but any stray hatchery fish that go in there, they do remove them. So at Pelton, we do remove a pretty significant proportion of the Pelton round butte stock. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Uh, another question from, from Ralph. Uh, the question is, has raising the water temperature in the Deschutes contributed to the poor survival of Columbia River summer steelhead? Um, I mean, that's a complicated question um, to unravel, but, you know, essentially, um, you know, since the SWW has gone online, um, if you, you know, if you look at the data, if you look at the temperature data, both at Madras and at um, at Moody, the temperature data shows that the, it's actually when the bulk of the adult steelhead are entering the lower Deschutes, um, which is typically, you know, late August to, you know, most of September, the temperatures now are currently cooler than what they were prior to 2010. Um, so I would say that the, you know, if anything, they're having less impacts on mortality. Great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, we have a couple questions here from, from David. The first one uh, is, how does the number of wild steelhead passing shears falls in one year correlate to setting fisheries in the very next year? Okay, yeah, I think I mentioned that in the in my presentation. You know, we do our mark recapture estimate where we estimate um, the number of fish that have passed over shears falls by May 1st. And, you know, if the number of steelhead that we estimate are, you know, below 625, um, you know, that's when we start uh, taking, you know, fish or putting into place fishery restrictions. But if we have an estimate which is more robust and above 60, 625, then um, the fishery remains open. Okay. Great. Um, this one's a little bit complicated, so I'll I'll ask it, and and if uh, if it's hard to decipher, maybe we can reply um, after the meeting. Uh, but the question from David: uh, Do you know what proportion of unclipped adults returning each year are not truly wild fish, but are instead offspring from hatchery hatchery crosses or hatchery wild cross mating that has occurred in nature? Oh uh, yeah, that's a lot. Again, a lot. To unravel. Um, they, well, I think actually I was just talking to Tucker um, earlier this week. You know, as far at Bonneville Dam, uh, generally um, for A runs, the number of unmarked um, hatchery steelhead is about 15% of the total number of steelhead that are. Or wild steelhead or unmarked steelhead going over Bonneville. Um, we have looked at um, generally on the Deschutes at our Shears Trap, it's been around, um, you know, five to 10 percent on some years where, you know, there are unmarked hatchery fish that are, you know, swimming around that an angler would recognize as a, as a wild fish. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, let me see here. Let me see. Hold on. I think that's all I have for you for now. But if I find another one that comes in, Jason, I'll come back to you. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we have a question here for uh, the John Day. 
while I'm getting organized. Um, okay, this question is from James uh, for Steph. So Steph, if a Columbia River, uh, if a Columbia tributary is closed to steelhead fishing for all or part of a 2023 season, uh, will ODFNW coordinate with Oregon State Police to continue or increase compliance checks uh, and enforcement on anglers in the area? For example, if the John Day is closed to steelhead in 23, it will be important for OSP to check anglers and ensure they're not targeting steelhead. Yeah, we coordinate with OSP on an annual basis. We meet with them uh, once a year, and I have every OSP officer in the John Day on my cell phone um, and my contacts, and I talk to them frequently, and we report when we see anglers or if we have an issue with somebody potentially fishing or we get rumors of someone fishing. Um, and OSP does a really good job. And since the closures for the last two years, uh, I, I feel like it's been going great. OSP has prioritized steelhead enforcement in the John Day in recent years, and um, we've issued quite a few citations. So it's it's complicated because there is lots of miles. I'm not going to give you some secret info of how to cheat the system, but it can be difficult because of the wild and, and nature of the John Day. But we have tools in the toolbox, and we do utilize them, and we are actively out there. So okay, I, I feel like... Yeah. Okay, thanks, Steph. Um, got a couple more. I want to make sure we can get to a couple questions for Kyle as well, but one more for you uh, from David. Um, the question is, what other means What other means exist to reduce angler impacts besides closures? ODFW, for example, has green light fisheries. They're open full throttle, red light, closed all steelhead, but no yellow light fisheries that might, that might provide opportunity while lessening encounter rates by limiting angler access similar to in limited entry hunting regulations or by limiting gear, limiting hours or days, et cetera? Yeah, we absolutely have had many conversations in recent months regarding that. Um, at what point do we consider a threshold where we can have a you know yellow light fishery as Dave describes? Uh, that is something that we are actively pursuing and trying to wrap our heads around. Uh, there's lots of different options, but we have to weigh the appropriate spatial scale and uh, data collection that we need. And a lot of our creel data is a little bit older. Um, we need ELS potentially to be in place, um, but we are looking at different options. We wanna continue to maintain opportunity um, in those yellow light fisheries as you described. But one of the key components that I would ask um, all people interested in fishing in the John Day in the future is that, you know, that ELS piece is a pretty key component. Um, and on the hunting side, as you probably know, we ask mandatory reporting on your tags um, without giving us information. I, I know that there's a little bit of that um, mindset that the more info that ODFW gets, the more we're gonna close or the more you know damaging it is for us to manage it. But without proper information, we don't know that. Um, we know that where there are areas of high use and, and high targeted um, areas by, by folks fishing for steelhead. And if we can, if we decide that we can still have a fishery, but potentially close certain areas, certain reaches where there is a high impact, um, we need to know that. And we're working at that. So uh, stay tuned. But uh, unfortunately, 17,300 wild days is a little bit too low to entertain something like that. But we are thinking about that. Great stuff. Thanks very much. Uh, one more question uh, for up the basin for Kyle. And I think this will be our last question of the evening. Um, so Kyle, a question from James. Uh, the question is, how is ODFW going to protect against undue angling pressure on wild steelhead in the Grand Rod in 2023, since it has not had additional gear or season date restrictions in recent seasons? So I've, uh, sorry, um, we have a pretty robust creel survey here in the basin so we keep pretty close eyes on these fisheries so we're always looking for the amount of angler hours that occur in a season and uh hatchery fish that are caught and harvested and then um wild fish that are caught um in the last few years with low returns we've actually seen our effort decrease we have pretty strong relationships that when abundance is low uh, so is angler effort and it's about as low as we've seen it in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, additionally, I've done a lot of work on creels on looking at those bag limits, as I mentioned earlier, and 
we've only got about 5% of the people out there catching more than one fish. So reducing a bag limit down to one or something like that just doesn't really save us a whole lot. It just causes a lot more confusion for anglers having to do temporary rules and stuff. So um, that's part of the reason I keep it wide open. But our um, our angler impacts actually decline with four run years because of the, angle, the drop in angler effort. So right now, I don't feel like it's necessary to add those additional restrictions, especially um, considering our low our low impacts on these fish already. Okay, great. Thanks, Kyle. And, and with that, uh, that brings the webinar to a close. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks to all the biologists for all your time and effort. Um, we're going to, like I said earlier, we're going to post this presentation to our website. Um, so folks that haven't seen it can take a look at it or go back and review it again. Uh, you can also ask questions. We're going to leave that that WUFU form link that you've been uh, uh, putting questions in. We're going to leave that open for the next couple of weeks. Um, but also on our website, uh, you can or you can email us at odfnw.steelhead at odfnw.oregon.gov or certainly reach out to your, your individual biologist. Uh, everyone had given some contact information tonight. Uh, and they can answer any additional questions. So thanks again and have a great night.